بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam as we promised today we're going to continue um, the lesson concerning Al-Adhkar the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and uh, we said that we are going to share today's or this afternoon's lesson the adhkar they are related to the prayer but more specifically they come after as salat and they are known as al-adhkar adbar as salawat the adhkar that come immediately after the prayer and these adhkar that are after the prayer are six adhkar they are six adhkar and they only are to be said after the obligatory prayers so these adhkar are not said after the voluntary prayers they are only said after al-fajr wal-dhuhr wal-asr wal-maghrib wal-isha and it's very important that a believer knows these adhkar and then more importantly commits to these adhkar adheres to them and says them after the prayers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا Allah Azza wa Jal, he made mention of a reward for those who make, uh, for those who remember Allah Azza wa Jal in abundance. In this ayah he said, those male, the men and the women, الذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات the male and the female those who remember Allah عز وجل in abundance Allah has prepared for them مغفرة a complete forgiveness of their sins وأجرا عظيما and a great reward and the great reward means the paradise Ibn al-Salah رحمه الله when he commented on this ayah he said how does a person become from those who have remembered Allah in abundance because the reward is for those who remember Allah in abundance. How does a person know what is the measure to know if I'm from those who have rem remembered Allah in abundance or am I of those who remember Allah a little? As the Sheikh mentioned today at the Fajr talk, that it is a quality of the hypocrites that they hardly remember Allah Azza wa Jal. For the believer, he remembers Allah in abundance. So what is the measure? Ibn Salah rahimahullah, he said, those who commit to the morning and evening adhkar and the adhkar after the prayers and the adhkar before sleep are considered among those who have made remembrance of Allah in abundance. For this is what a believer is supposed to be committed upon at least from the adhkar. The adhkar of the morning and the evening, the adhkar after the prayers and the adhkar before sleep. And at the end of the talk, I will share with you the name of an app that, alhamdulillah, we have worked with, and we have worked on with a group from the UK, and there are unique features in it. I will share it with you at the end of the talk, and I'll teach you how to use it, inshallah ta'ala. So, the adhkar after the prayers are a big deal. If you're saying them five times a day after the five daily prayers, then you're a third of the way, you're a third of the way, in being recognized and considered from among those who remember Allah in abundance. All you then need to do is commit to the adhkar of the morning and the evening, and then the adhkar before sleep, and then يعني, the other adhkar of the day and the night. But these are the most important of them. So the adhkar after, after the prayer, we said they are six, and there's something very important you're supposed to know about them before we share them. And that is that the adhkar after the prayer, there is an incredible relationship between them and the prayer itself. Every dhikr that you say after the prayer of these six adhkar, in one way or another, directly or indirectly, you have said them in as-salat. They've already been said in the prayer. So as though once you finish as-salat, you make these adhkar after the prayer, and you're being reminded of the meanings that you just said in as-salat. For this is like the conclusion of the prayer. 
And this is how Allah Azza wa Jal keeps the believer tied to a salat. So there are six. Let's begin with the first one and we'll move on until we get to the sixth one. Bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. First and foremost, there is a narration that Anas radiallahu anhu mentioned. He said that the people used to yukabbiruna ba'da salat. They used to make takbir after the prayer. Al-ulama, rahimahumullah, they differed among each other as to what does this takbir immediately after the prayer mean. So some said, it is a sunnah, as soon as the imam concludes the salat, that the congregation says in a loud voice, Allahu Akbar, and then you begin, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. And the more correct opinion, Wallahu A'lam, is that they used to make takbir after the prayer, it means the adhkar. So the takbir in this narration doesn't literally mean to say Allahu Akbar after as salat Rather, at takbir means they used to engage in the adhkar after the prayer, which are six. That's what is meant. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Muddathir, He said, وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ Declare the greatness of your Lord. What does وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ mean? The ulama rahimahumullah said, أَيُذْكُرْهُ Make remembrance of his. So when you say, La ilaha illallah, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wallahu akbar, that is all in the meaning of وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ طيب. So that's the first narration of Anas radiallahu anhu. He's saying that the companions used to make dhikr after the prayer. The first of them came in the hadith of Thawban radiallahu anhu. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Thawban radiallahu anhu says, كان إذا انصرف من صلاته استغفر ثلاثا. When the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would finish from the prayer, he would seek Allah's forgiveness three times. So that's the first thing to be done after the conclusion of the prayer. والعلماء رحمهم الله mention that the best version of seeking forgiveness is to stay أستغفر الله وأتوب إليه. So that's the best version. So now, as soon as you finish the prayer, the first thing you say is Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. That's the highest and the greatest of versions of seeking Allah's forgiveness. And the minimum version is to just say Astaghfirullah three times. Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. And that's what you see commonly written on the apps or on the big posters. Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Okay, so where did I get Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh from? Here, there is Al-Walid, Al-Walid ibn Muslim, rahimahullah, he asked Al-Imam Al-Awza'i, rahimahullah. Al-Awza'i is the one who narrated the hadith of Thawban, that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would seek forgiveness three times after the prayer. Fal-Walid ibn Muslim asked Al-Awza'i, he said to him, Mal istighfar? What is seeking Allah's forgiveness after the prayer? What is it? Fal-Awza'i said to him, that you say, Astaghfirullah. That you say, Astaghfirullah. Al-Ulama rahimahumullah, they said, if there was one version that was known and memorized among the companions, then Al-Walid ibn Muslim wouldn't have asked Al-Awza'i this question. As a result, from this incident, Ulama rahimahumullah concluded that seeking Allah's forgiveness after the prayer has versions. The best of them is to say, Astaghfirullah, atubu ilayh, and the minimum is to say, Astaghfirullah. Tamam? Then that's the first thing. And when you look at the hadith of Thawban, he said when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finished his prayer, إِسْتَغْفَرَ ثَلَاثًا He sought forgiveness three times. The narration didn't say, he said, أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ three times. He sought forgiveness. And the best way to seek forgiveness is to couple الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ with التَّوْبَةِ أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this in the Qur'an. About the prophets, they would come to their people and say, 
The result يمتعكم متاعا حسنا إلى أجل مسمى ويا قوم استغفروا ربكم ثم توبوا إليه Seek Allah عز وجل's forgiveness and then repent Seeking Allah's forgiveness means that you're asking Allah to wipe away the sins of the past and repenting to Allah is a commitment from you that you're going to advance forward in your obedience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what At-Tawbah means. At-Tawbah means ar rujuah returning, returning, returning to Allah's commands, returning to the obligations once again. When we say astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh, three times after as-salat, what are you seeking istighfar of? You just finished the greatest deed a human being could ever do, and that is the prayer. And people relate astaghfirullah with sins. If someone did a sin, we say astaghfirullah. You spoke a bad word, astaghfirullah. This is what we do. So how come the first thing we're saying after the greatest deed a person could do, a salat, we're immediately told to say astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. The ulama rahimahumullah said that when you seek forgiveness after the prayer, then this seeking forgiveness is because of the shortcomings that happened in a salat. No one can claim and say, I prayed, now we just prayed Asr. Who dares to say, I prayed the Asr that I just prayed 100% to how Allah Azza wa Jal wants it from me? No one would dare to say this. Yani we had a moment of heedlessness in a salat. We forgot to say something in a salat. Right? The heart was distracted by something in a salat. This is normal, this happens. This is why the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say that a person might finish his salat and only earn half of, of the salat in its reward. And then he said, perhaps a person could earn a tenth and an eighth or a seventh or a sixth or a fifth or a fourth or a third or a half. That's how people are. People finish a salat some of them earned just a tenth of the reward of the prayer. And some earned half the reward. And you know, notice in that hadith, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not say, and some would walk away with complete reward. The maximum he mentioned in that hadith was half. Yani it is extremely difficult to receive the maximum reward of a salat. For how much are we in need to say, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh after a salat? This seeking forgiveness after the prayer rectifies those shortcomings. It patches those shortcomings. So if your salat was bleeding, this astaghfirullah is like a band-aid. It's a band-aid on this bleeding of a salat and it completes it bi-ithnillah and it goes to Allah Azza wa Jal. Fa'idhan al-istighfar, three times after a salat, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. The next one, this is the second, so we've done the first. Second one, it came in the hadith of Thawban radiallahu anhu, that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would seek forgiveness three times, and then he would say, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarakta ya dhal jalali wal ikram. And that is to be said once. Well, istighfar, by the way, is supposed to be said three times. It is impermissible to say it more than three times. La yujuz. Not allowed, impermissible. After as-salat, al-istighfar is only three times. You're not allowed to add to this. And there is wisdom. Well, this is how Allah Azza wa Jal taught us. This is what the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Whoever thinks to say it more than three times is better, then this is a sin that he earns. And this is arrogance. Do you think that more than three times is better? Yani, Yani Allah Azza wa Jal, what he legislated and what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did is not good enough. And now you're coming to say that four times is better, five times is better, for then it is not allowed to go over three. After that, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarakta yadha al-jalali wal-ikram once. And there is a narration in Sahih al-Bukhari. This is the narration of Aisha radiallahu anha, so it's also authentic. That the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarakta dhal jalali wal ikram. Without the ya. Yeah. So, at times say 
تباركت يا ذا الجلال والإكرام and at other times say تباركت ذا الجلال والإكرام without the yeah both of them were narrated in the highest يعني authentic way possible in the ahadith إذن that's the second thing that you say and by the way these two things are supposed to be the first two things you say after the prayer so then you need to get them in order in this manner Al-Istighfar three times first, then Allahumma anta as-salam wa minka as-salam tabarakta ya dha al-jalali wal-ikram. Either now, we've done two. The third dhikr that comes after the prayer, and that is the hadith of Al-Mughir ibn Shu'bah, radiya Allahu anhu, and it is found in al-Sahihayn in Bukhari wa Muslim, that when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would finish his prayer, he would say, لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير اللهم لا مانع لما أعطيت ولا معطي لما منعت ولا ينفع ذا الجد منك الجد and that's said once the first half you're familiar with the second half is اللهم لا مانع لما أعطيت and you know this اللهم لا مانع لما أعطيت it is said in the prayer it is said specifically in ar rafa من الركوع. When you come up from ar rukuah there is a dhikr that you say, which is, رَبَّنَا وَلَكَ الْحَمْدِ حَمْدًا كَثِيرًا طَيِّبًا مُبَارَكًا فِيهِ All the way until the end of it, اللهم لا مانع لما أعطيت ولا معطي لما منعت ولا ينفع ذا الجد منك الجد. اللهم لا مانع لما أعطيت. You're saying, oh Allah, no one can withhold that which you gave. If Allah Azza wa Jal decreed for you to receive a blessing, no one will be able to deprive you of it, no matter what they do. And at the same time, وَلَا مُعْطِيَ لِمَا مَنَعْتِ And if Allah has deprived something from you, if the entire world was to get together to give it to you, it will never reach you. وَلَا مُعْطِيَ لِمَا مَنَعْتِ When you're seeing this dhikr, you're reflecting over how insignificant you are. And you're reflecting at the same time, the power of Allah Azza wa Jal and the ability of Allah Azza wa Jal and how Allah Azza wa Jal controls everything and every affair that happens on this earth. Subhanallah. You say this dhikr and then you reflect over the fact that you've just prayed. If Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to deprive you of this prayer, no matter how many lessons and how many talks are given, no one will be able to make you pray. This doesn't only mean in, in worldly matters, but also in spiritual matters. Allahumma la mani'a lima a'tayt, wa la mu'atiyya lima mana'at. Allah Azza wa Jal deprives people from matters of worship. And He gives people matters of worship. And whoever is given matters of worship, and He finds it easy, and He finds ability to worship Allah, no one will be ever able to remove this from him. And if someone doesn't worship, and he doesn't come onto the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal with eagerness and love for this worship, then if the entire scholars of this world came together, even if it was Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself came and preached to this person, no one will be able to give him the ability. It is all in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. And at the end of that dhikr, وَلَا يَنْفَعُ ذَا الْجَدِّ مِنْكَ الْجَدِّ What does that mean? وَلَا يَنْفَعُ ذَا الْجَدِّ مِنْكَ الْجَدِّ Meaning a person's wealth and a person's honor and a person's dignity and a person's nobility and a person's children will not benefit him anything in the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is what it means. وَلَا يَنْفَعُ ذَا الْجَدِّ مِنْكَ الْجَدِّ is teaching you that everything you have doesn't benefit you before Allah Azza wa Jal. Zero. It's nothing. The only thing that's going to benefit you before Allah Azza wa Jal are your righteous deeds. That's it. That's the only thing that's going to count on the day of judgment for you. From your, starting from your grave. That's the only thing that will benefit you. Now, For even this is the third dhikr that is supposed to be said and it's only once. And you say it as it is. La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahul mulku wa lahul hamdu ala kulli shayin qadir. اللهم لا مانع لما أعطيت ولا معطي لما منعت ولا ينفع ذا الجد منك الجد. The fourth one that is said 
Now you repeat the tahleel once again. So now the fourth one we're sharing. And this is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu found in Sahih Muslim. That the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he would conclude the prayer, he would say, La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ولا نعبد إلا إياه له النعمة وله الفضل وله الثناء الحسن لا إله إلا الله مخلصين له الدين ولو كره الكافرون That is to be said once as it is and I'll share them as we did yesterday in the app inshallah ta'ala So that is to be said once and so you focus there is a repetition of التهليل there is a repetition of the greatest statement that is ever known on man, uh, to, to man. And that is, لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير. Then you say, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. Remember yesterday we shared something about لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. And we shared some of its meaning. And we said that a person is never able to change his state of disbelief to belief. You cannot change from sin to obedience. You cannot change from innovation to sunnah. You cannot change from kufr to iman. And then you don't have any power wala quwwata illa billah. Except if Allah Azza wa Jal was to give you this ability and this power. And you see how powerful this is, is now you've finished the salat. You've prayed this prayer. Allah has given you the ability to pray it. And then after the salat you're declaring that there was no way that I was able to pray this prayer. And there is no way I will be able to say this dhikr right now, illa billah, except if you gave me permission. Subhanallah. You feel very insignificant. And you feel as though Allah Azza wa Jal has blessed you. And indeed He has. And He has selected you from among His servants to be making His dhikr at this time. Subhanallah. فَإِذَا لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ Then you say, لَهُ النِّعْمَةُ وَلَهُ الْفَضْلُ وَلَهُ الثَّنَاءُ الْحَسَنُ لَهُ النِّعْمَةُ To him belongs all praise. وَلَهُ الْفَضْلُ And to him all favors belong to him. وَلَهُ الثَّنَاءُ الْحَسَنُ And every good word and every praiseworthy quality belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَهُ الثَّنَاءُ الْحَسَنُ Then you say, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ You declare that there is no Lord worthy of worship except Allah. وَلَا نَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ And we do not worship anyone except him. مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينِ and we worship him in a state of sincerity. وَلَا نَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينِ Meaning we worship him while we are in a state, our heart is in a state of sincerity. لَهُ الدِّينِ Every matter in religion, when we do it, we do it sincerely for Allah Azza wa Jal. And part of a deen, part of religion, is the adhkar that you're saying after the prayer. And so a person needs to be sincere in that as well. You be sincere in that. مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينِ At the end, وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ Even if the disbelievers were to dislike this. Yani, if the disbelievers dislike that we worship Allah alone and we are sincere to Him, then we will continue to worship Him alone and remain sincere to Him alone even if they dislike it. Because we're not worshipping them. And we don't uh, benefit anything from them. And we're not seeking any appreciation from them. And we're not seeking any approval or praise from them. And not, we're, we're not seeking any acceptance from them. So even if they hate and dislike what we're doing, we will carry on with worshipping Allah Azza wa the way Allah wants from us. And with this word, walaw kariha al-kafirun, the concept of al-wala wal bara is being established in the heart of the believer. And that is that part of your belief in Allah is to love what Allah loves and to hate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. And so as you're sitting and you're saying, وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ You're acknowledging, that you're, 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 you're emphasizing and you're reminding yourself once again that I'm doing my worships for Allah. I don't care who hates this and who's disliked with it. If this is what Allah loves and this is what Allah is pleased with, even if the entire world was against me, I will continue to worship Allah and obey Him and abide by His commands the way He wants. 
This is what it means. طيب, even we say this once, and that's the fourth dhikr. The fifth of these adhkar that come after the prayer, now it's at tasbih wat tahleel, wat takbir, wat tahmeed. Now it's the tasbih, which is subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Let's speak about this. These tasbih are of many forms. There's about five narrations. And there are five ways in how you can make this tasbih in terms of what to say and how many times to say it. The minimum. I will share with you first the minimum of the tasbih. And this is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As in Sahih Muslim. That the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to say subhanallah walhamdulillah wallahu akbar ten times after each prayer. That's the minimum version. Ten times. And when we say ten times, we mean to say subhanallah wa. You say the wa as well. Subhanallah wa alhamdulillah wa allahu akbar. So the wa is to be said. The wa is to be said. And to be placed in the same order as it came in the hadith. Subhanallah walhamdulillah wallahu akbar. Ten times. And the tasbih is to be done on the hand. And it's preferred that it's done on the right hand. Because the narration mentions that كَانَ يَعْقِدُ التَّسْبِيحَ بِيَمِينِهِ That the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would count the tasbih with his right hand. And the best and correct and closest to the sunnah in how the tasbih is done on the hand is to close the open finger starting from the pinky. So you do, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, allahu akbar. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, allahu akbar. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, allahu akbar. Like this, like this. This is five. Then you open again and you count another five. And that's ten. And it is not to open the finger. So if you close them, don't go back from here and open. Even if you did that, it's fine. But it's not known as ya'qid. Al-uqdah, meaning to not, to close the finger. Not to open it. So like this, we're doing like this five times, then you're opening and you're doing again. And if you used your left hand to count, there's no problem. But what we're speaking about is what is best and most preferred and closest to Sunnah al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is also other ways that were mentioned, such as tapping on the tips of the finger. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wallahu akbar, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wallahu akbar, to tap. On the, on the tips of the finger. That has also been narrated because it gives the same understanding of al, al, al-uqdah. Because when you do this, you're also closing a finger. You're doing that tie, you're doing that circle. But wallahu alam, what is closer to that which the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught is to close like this. And when you close like this, one more thing, because there is the, the other, the another hadith of uh, al-anamil, فَإِنَّهُنَّ مُسْتَنْطَقَاتِ Al-anamil is the tip of the finger. So when you close it, you make sure that the tip of the finger touches the palm of the hand. You make sure that the tip of the finger, of every finger, touches the palm of the hand. Now we have done it as close as we can to what the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught. And in this way, you have joined all the hadith and you have not contradicted any hadith in your action. And that's the best possible way of doing them. Like this, while tapping the palm of your hands. Allahu alam. Naam. So the minimum, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wallahu akbar, ten times each. And if you began your day with saying them ten times, then it's best to continue the entire day ten times. So if you started al-fajr with subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wallahu akbar, ten times, then khalas, do that for Al-Dhuhr, Wal-Asr, Wal-Maghrib, Wal-Isha, for all the five prayers of that day. Why? Because in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhu, that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to him, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar, ten times, he said to him, Hunna mi'atun wa khamsuna ala al-lisan, alfun wa khamsumu'atin fi al-mizan. He said to him, Ya Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, 10 times after the prayer would equal to 150. 
So how can you achieve it equals to 150 on the tongue? Because if you're seeing them 10 times after every prayer, that's 10 times 5, that's 100 and 150, right? Because subhanAllah 10, walhamdulillah 10, wallahu akbar, 10. For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, that will be 150 times on the tongue. How would you say it 150 times on the tongue? Except for if you were to say them 10 times after each prayer. So if you started your day with 10 times, then you continue the whole day 10 times, right? Tamam. And by the way, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us that the one who says them 10 times after every prayer, that's one of the habits of the people of the paradise. Because the beginning of the hadith, There are two habits that if the believer was to adhere to and commit to, he enters the paradise with these two habits. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said they are easy, but those who commit to them a little, وَهُمَا قَلِيلٌ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلُوا بِهِمَا وَهُمَا يعني he said يسير وَمَنْ يَعْمَلُوا بِهِمَا قَلِيلٌ He said they are very easy and those who do them are very little. So one of these habits was to say Subhanallah walhamdulillah Allahu Akbar ten times after all the prayers. And the second habit was to say Subhanallah walhamdulillah thirty-three times each. That's before sleep and Allahu Akbar thirty-four times. Thirty-four times. That's the second habit. Right. So let's get back to our Adhkar after the prayer. And that's the minimum we said. And then we understood that. And we said to say that wow there, subhanallah, wa alhamdulillah, wa Allahu akbar. And to say them in this order, subhanallah first, alhamdulillah second, Allahu akbar third. And to say them like that as you count ten. That's the best. And that way you avoid a problem that a lot of people fall into. When people take subhanallah on its own, and want to say it 10 times, subhanallah, 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 he ends up just seeing, 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 and the whole tasbih is gone. Right? Or alhamdulillah, 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 and then the entire hamd is gone. So in order to avoid this common problem, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wallahu akbar, make sure that you cannot rush through it. And now you're saying all of them with their letters correctly. And the highest version of a tasbih after the prayers and this is what's found a lot on the posters and the, and the apps. And that is to say, Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar, 33 times each, and then ending with the hundredth by saying, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. A lot of the apps, many of the posters put this narration because it mentioned a great reward. And that was the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. In when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever says subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wallahu akbar, 33 times after every prayer, and then he says, la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulk wa lahu alhamdu wa hu ala kulli shay'in qadir, and concludes the hundredth with that, then his sins would be forgiven even if they were to amount the foam of the ocean. If you have observed and if you've seen the foam of the ocean, that white stuff, that bubbly white stuff that accumulates at the shore of the ocean, that's known as Zabad al-Bahr. And that, if you see it in its actual form, it is as far as the eye can see. It's a lot. Maybe you haven't seen it in your life before. Maybe you can go on YouTube and see the foam of the ocean. You'll see incredible images and videos of how huge the foam of the ocean is if it happens. All of that is forgiven. Even if your sins were to amount that much, all of it is forgiven. With this tasbih, after as salat. Then that's the highest version. And I shared with you the minimum version. And the final dhikr that is to be said after the prayer, and that's the sixth one, is to read ayat al-kursi. And this is found in Sunan al-Nasai. The hadith is narrated by Umam al-Bahili radiyallahu anhu. In which he said, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that whoever reads ayat al kursi after the prayer, nothing stands between him and the paradise except death. Meaning, if you read ayat al kursi after as salat, then you're from the people of the paradise. The only thing holding you back is that you're still living, you haven't died yet. 
If you are to die, a person immediately has been granted access to the paradise. This is powerful. And if you're saying this five times a day, then you're always on top of things and making sure that you have renewed this contract between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And imagine this, the greatest ayah in the Qur'an was ayat al-Kursi. Why? Why was the greatest ayah in the Qur'an ayat al-Kursi? Because it spoke about the greatest matter we ever know, and that is at-Tawheed, the oneness of Allah azza wa jal. It spoke about at-Tawheed, the, the oneness of Allah azza wa jal. Is there anything greater? There's nothing greater. And it began with Allah, la ilaha illa huwa al-hayy al qayyum It began with kalimatu at-Tawheed, which is la ilaha illa Allah. فإذا this is what is supposed to be said. The istighfar, Allahumma anta salam, then la ilaha illa Allah, and with it Allahumma la mani alima atayt, then once again la ilaha illa Allah, and with it la hawla wa la quwa ta illa billah wa la na'abudu illa iya, then subhanallah wa alhamdulillah, wallahu akbar, 10 times each in the minimum form, in the maximum 33, plus la ilaha illa Allah at the end to make 100, and then ayat al kursi. These are six adhkar. And these are the most authentic adhkar that were mentioned with the authenticity of an ummah. Except ayat al-Kursi, there is khilaf concerning the hadith, the reward in the hadith. However, there is no khilaf that ayat al-Kursi is to be read after the obligatory prayers. Now, there remains an issue, and that is al-mu'awwidhat, or al-mu'awwidhatayn, surah al-ikhlas, we were all raised that this is also part of the adhkar after the prayer. And there is no issue. There is no problem if you were to add to this list of six or seventh and to say, I will read Surah Al-Ikhlas, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas, no problems. But for whoever wants a detailed ruling on the ahadith, then most of the ulama, rahimahumullah, have declared the hadith of al-mu'awwidhatayn weak. That is the hadith of Uqba ibn Amr radiallahu anhu, in where he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded him to read al-mu'awwidhatayn after the prayers. Surah al-Ikhlas wa nas As for Surah al-Falaq, as for Surah al-Ikhlas, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Then the majority of ulama have declared this narration weak. So, once again, you can read them. No problems. And if you were to read them, then it's only once after every prayer. I know there are some versions that mention Al-Ikhlas, Wal-Falaq, Wal-Nas three times after Al-Fajr, three times after Asr, and once after the rest of the prayers. Like, and this is even weaker. The one who is going to read them would read them once after all the prayers. And what is meant by three times after Fajr and three times after Asr, that's another hadith of Uqba ibn Amr. And in that hadith, he was referring to the morning adhkar and the evening adhkar. That's separate to the prayers, right? فَإِذَنْ Now we have this narration. Whoever wants to say them, say them. If you skip them and miss them at times, there is absolutely no issue in that bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. There remains now with us to conclude our lesson, four matters to discuss. Number one. How are these adhkar to be arranged? The only arrangement that you need to be aware of is the first two. Al-istighfar three times immediately, that must be the first thing after as-salat. And then Allahumma anta salam is supposed to come straight after the istighfar. The rest of what we mentioned, there is no order that needs to be followed. You can mix that around. So after you say Allahumma anta salam, you can begin with your tasbih. You can read Ayat al-Kursi. You can say La ilaha. You can do whatever you want with the rest of the adhkar that we spoke about. So that's number one. Number two, do we say these adhkar after the prayer aloud or silently? Uh, Al-ulama, rahimahumullah, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah and others have mentioned that the sunnah is to say them aloud after the prayer. To say them aloud. There's narration that Anas radiallahu anhu says, كانوا يجهرون بالذكر بعد الصلاة كنا في عهد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ونجهر بالذكر بعد الصلاة والجهر الجهر تسيدم ألا ضد الجهر مين إن إسلام الجهر 
is أن يرفع الذاكر صوته بقصد إسماع غيره ولو لم يسمعه غيره This is what loud means in Islam It means to raise your voice with the takbir and to intend for others to hear you even if no one heard you That's what al-jahr means So when you're saying your adhkar astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh astaghfirullah wa atubu I'm intending for those left and right of me to hear me and that's how the masjid should be. It should be loud with people making dhikr. Now, you avoid raising your voice in a dhikr if there are still people that are praying. Yeah, let's say they came late to a salat. Now, here now your dhikr and saying it aloud is going to disrupt them in their salat. So you now say it silently. But for example, when you're in al-masjid al-haram, 99% of the people are praying on time. And everyone is finishing with the Imam. And there's barely anyone getting up to complete a raka'ah or two, right? Because everyone goes early. So in that case, since the people on your left and right and in front of you and behind you have all finished as salat, raise your voice with a takbir. Raise your voice. Not, not, not like a shouting voice, but as we said, raising it, intending for those that are around you to hear you, even if no one heard you. And opposite to that, a sir, silence in Islam means that you lower your voice, with the intention of no one hearing you, even if someone heard you. That's what silence means. So in silence, you're intending for no one to hear you. But if someone heard you, that doesn't matter. You know? Okay, so that's al-jahr. The third matter that needs to also be discussed is al-waqt. How much time do we have to say the adhkar after the prayer? Here again, al-ulama rahimahumullah mention that the time is open. From after the salat all the way until the adhan of the next prayer. So we finished the asr for example. If any one of you hasn't done the adhkar after salat al asr, mumkin you can do now. You can do after the lesson. You have all the way until just before adhan al maghrib. All of this is a correct time for a dhikr ba'd al salat. Very simple. And it is only allowed to do qada of the dhikr in two conditions or with two conditions qada al dhikr meaning if I didn't say them after asr and the adhan of al-maghrib has been called and we prayed al-maghrib and I didn't do the adhkar after al-asr can I say them now after adhan al-maghrib let's say I haven't prayed al-maghrib yet I'm still after adhan al-maghrib can I say them now no but if you fit into two conditions yes these two conditions, number one, that you are a person who is committed on the adhkar. You're someone that always says the adhkar. Second condition, that you miss them genuinely. Something distracted you, you were busy, you got occupied with something, uh, someone spoke to you about something, there was an urgent matter you needed to attend to and all the way, you forgot. And then you heard the adhan al-maghrib and you remembered, I didn't say the adhkar after al-asr. No problems. If you fit those two conditions, you can say them now. But if you're someone who is يعني, barely making these adhkar after the prayer, and you had plenty of time to say them, but you just neglected, لا, خلص. And tell you why, you can't do qada of the dhikr after its time. Because there are things that you can do qada of, and there are things that, if their time is gone, there's no qada for him. This is some of the things. Among them as well is like the two prayers, tahiyyat al-masjid. If you entered the masjid and you sat down, Khalas, you don't get up to pray them. The time is gone, finished. Oh yeah, mustahab, yani. If you, if, you were to, if you came in and you missed it, and then you remembered, you don't get up and you pray it, because mahalluha fat, its time has gone, finished. That, there's no qaba for this. And similar to the adhkar, طيب. so the qaba is only in those two instances. And then we remain with, um, with one, issue, one more issue, and that is, what is best, to say them sitting, or to finish and get up and walk and say them. So there is no doubt that you remain seated after the prayer and saying them until you finish is better than getting up and saying them. For two reasons. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that a person remains and continues to be in a state of prayer while he sits in his place of prayer. Huh. The sitting you're sitting after as-salat 
is still considered a part of the salah. It's considered a part of the salah. So don't waste that on yourself. And you've got something to preoccupy yourself with and, and busy yourself with the adhkar. So keep seated during that time you're doing adhkar. And the other reason is the angels make dua for the one who continues to remain seated after as salat. The angels, they make dua for the one who continues to remain seated after as salat. Taqul, Allahumma ghfir lahu, Allahumma arhamhu. The angels will say, Allah, Allah grant him mercy, Allah forgive him, grant him mercy, forgive him, grant him mercy, forgive him. They continue to make dua for you, so long as you're sitting. Once you get up, the dua has stopped. So this is why it is best to sit down. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to sit down and say the adhkar. Tayyib, at times you cannot do that. Sometimes there is a person is busy, he has to get up after the salat immediately and move. And if that's the case, then it doesn't mean you neglect. Say the adhkar as you're walking. As you're walking. And if you cannot because you're busy, then say them after you finish what you have in your hand. The main thing is don't, yani you got a large window to say them. What we are sharing is the best of the best. Sit down and say them is the best of the best. Right? Uh, you couldn't, then say them as you're walking. You are distracted with something, say them later. The idea is, the idea, and why did the ulama rahimahullah dis discuss these things? That are so detailed, that perhaps most of you never heard of or never thought of. All of this is because the ulama are teaching us the importance of remaining attached to Allah. Look how important it is. Don't behave with the adhkar as something that, yep, yeah, we got, and it is a sunnah of Rasulullah, alhamdulillah, it's preserved in the books, and it's good to know. That, that kind of behavior weakens the heart in terms of its relationship with Allah. They are there for a purpose. Make use of them. Your life is going to go by. And you're going to age. And you're going to die. When did you ever think of committing to these afkar? And taking them seriously. And sitting down and memorizing them. And giving them time to say. They're as important as the prayer itself. And as, as important as other worships we do. And this is from Sunnah al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are many, many stories. Of the companions relationships with the afkar. This is like vital medicine. So you finished as salat and the adhkar after the prayer they come and they're reminding you of the meanings of the prayer. As though a person remains attached to as salat. Every dhikr after the prayer in one way or another is found in as salat itself. Also the ulama rahimahumullah they say that the adhkar after the prayer it's to remind the believer who you are just standing in between whose hand. Yeah, and you know, sometimes I give you an example. Let's say we were sitting in this gathering, and among us was a famous figure in Islam, a religious scholar, well known. He was sitting among us. And then after we finished the gathering, he went. And then I came to someone, and we say to each other, Do you know who was in our presence? And I start speaking about him and who was in our presence, and so on. I remind myself. When you pray your salat, you are standing before Allah. And then after the salat, you're reminding yourself. And to, do you know who you're standing before? You are standing in front of Allah. La ilaha illa huwa al -hayyu al -qayyum. The one la ta'khuduhu sinatu wa la nawm. The one who lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. The one who man the ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi idhnihi ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum wa la yuhyutuna bi shayin min ilmihi illa bi ma sha'a. The one who wasi'a kursiyuhu samawati wal ard wa la ya'uduhu hifbuhuma wa huwa al-aliyu al-azim. And it's like you're left shocked and stunned. I was just standing. I was just standing in front of Allah. This is who I'm standing in. And you're reminding yourself just a couple of moments. You were in an actual conversation and in a meeting with Allah Azza wa it was real, it was happening. And then that excites you for the next prayer. And this is how it is. Wallahu alam. We'll stop here. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.